this is the last review of the bio ecology lecture series where we're going to be talking about nutrients and nutrient cycling within the ecosystem now before we do that I want to talk about something that's not really nutrients but it does have to do with chemicals in the ecosystem the idea is that when humans pollute the ecosystem the amounts of those pollutants will spread throughout the food web basically the algae will absorb some nutrients all right directly from the water because it's consuming that water now let's say the algae absorbs a little bit one unit of toxins but then the shrimp will eat the algae and maybe the shrimp will eat 10 algae but if each one of those 10 algae had one pollutant inside of it but that shrimp is going to have 10 pollutants inside of him but then the bottom feeders which will feed on the shrimp will also eat a lot of shrimp and now remember that as you're going up the food web there's going to be less and less energy available there's less and less numbers there's less and less biomass as you go higher and higher and it, since there's less and less energy in order to sustain larger and larger numbers especially since the predators tend to be bigger and bigger or more and more complex they are going to have to eat more and more to actually have to deal with that, that's those circumstances which is why actually when we talk about this in a different video it's actually beneficial to eat at the bottom levels because it can support more people there's more energy available so if you eat it like a vegetarian there's less uh, this, you can feed more people because there's more people available. So in other words, you can feed more people off the green field if you plant wheat on it. Then you can feed if you eat the cows which ate the field. And because remember that some of the energy that the cows are actually going to be eating is going to be wasted as the cows do their work and do heat and all those kinds of things. And that the cow will poop and not going to assimilate all of the food that it actually eats. Some of it doesn't get digested. That means it's more efficient to lower to eat at the bottom. It is also better to eat at the bottom because it has less toxins. And that's what we're going to talk about, continue talking about now. Now, if the bottom feeders will have to eat a lot more to come up with the same amount of energy that the shrimp was eating, so they will eat maybe a hundred shrimp. But now, if each of the shrimp that had 10 units of, of toxins inside of them, and now I had a hundred of those, by now I have a thousand, a thousand units of pollutants. What's happening here is that as you go each step on the food web up you the amount of pollutants in that organism is being maximized throughout the life they will continue to accumulate mutants those those pollutants and that's called bioaccumulation and then throughout the food web as you go higher and higher in the food pyramid you actually end up getting biomagnification of the toxins by the time you get to the top predator it's millions of times of toxicity of, that it was the bottom which is why again it's better to eat from the bottom but this is food for thought that when humans pollute the air and acid rain end up falling in the rivers, oil spills, uh, sewage spills, uh, waste from, uh, from factories or even trash ends up in the oceans, all of these things in lakes and rivers, all of these things will be affected and those, those things will end up being biomagnified and by the time we eat the things of the oceans, we're going to eat thousands of times. Uh, the amount of pollution that is actually available in the ecosystem and that's a big deal so that's why I mean, it's also good to eat at the bottom like we said there's gonna be more energy available at the bottom there's gonna be less toxins more food you can feed more people and it may even help the ecosystem in some ways although if you are eating too much from the bottom everybody else at the top of that will actually become affected because now you're competing with their nutrients so if there's an animal that also depends on the field now he's going to run out of food because you took the fuel from him. So that's a problem for ecosystems on the earth. Finally, matter cycles through ecosystems. We talked a little bit about that when we mentioned that the cycle of life, that the energy is going to flow. But as the energy flows, it flows through matter, through the organic compounds created by the producers using the energy of sunlight to make them, to build them. It's kind of like they're, they're the ones putting the Lego pieces together, but they needed energy from the sunlight to get to be able to do that. But ultimately, all those Lego pieces go back to the soil where the plants end up, end up using it again. So things cycle in nature. And the same thing is true about not just through life. They cycle in nature in general, through the atmosphere, the geosphere, the hydrosphere, and so forth. These are be called the biogeochemical cycles of nature. And there are several which are important for life. The first is the water cycle, which involves the process of water evaporating from the ocean. But not all of the water that evaporates from the ocean ends up falling in the actual ocean, which means some of that water ends up going to the land. So less water rains on the ocean than water evaporates from it, and that's what drives the, the water cycle. 
Now, in addition to that, water also comes from living things which, have, uh, which put water on their surface to cool them down. It's called evapotranspiration and from direct sublimation. Now, eventually, it will go up in the atmosphere, cool down, and rain as precipitation and other kinds of precipitation like ice and snow and sleet and all kinds of stuff. Sometimes that water from the rain will be trapped as ice for thousands and thousands of years in glaciers. Other times it will run down the mountains through rivers and streams and ends up in places like lakes or the groundwater table discharge as it seeps into the ground. If it seeps into the ground, the soil and the rocks in the ground will slow down the movement of the water for thousands of years before it actually gets to the oceans and sometimes even prevents it. But ultimately, all the water will return to the ocean to complete the water cycle, and that's kind of how it is. So, very important for life. It has to do with energy because it, the water needs energy to go from liquid to, to gaseous state, and it releases energy when it goes from gaseous state to, to uh, either solid or liquid state. So, this is, has to do with the absorption of energy as well, and it's a fundamental cycle since all life forms will rely on that water since most of our life forms are made up of water. Another fundamental cycle of life is the carbon cycle. And that's the, that's the cycle that has to do with cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Life traps carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and puts it into sugars into the process of photosynthesis. And it also releases in return oxygen, right? But then the, those producers get, fe get fed on and then the, the, all the organisms eat those and throughout the food web the, the carbon will spread in the sugar that it's uh, now trapped into. And then those things will do cellular respiration, and then some of the carbon goes back to the atmosphere as gas. Other carbon stays in the carcass of the organism and in the waste that as it dies, it will get decomposed uh, by other bacteria and things like that. Now, some of that material that gets decomposed actually puts carbon to the air again because decomposition also produces carbon dioxide. But sometimes the carbon will actually sit on the soil where we go lower and lower by a process called deposition. Other times, erosion will pick up the carbon and move it somewhere else, more often into the water. Now, the, carbon, the same process will happen in the water as well. Cell respiration, photosynthesis, feeding, deposition, all of that. Eventually, the carbon deposits and gets top onto each other and forms sedimentary rocks, which become ultimately carbonate rocks. Now, those carbonates can be eroded, and then the carbon goes back to the atmosphere or the water, or they can be uplifted or even be melted and become part of a volcano activity, which also releases carbon to the atmosphere. Carbon also goes to the atmosphere doing forest fires or when humans burn the fossil fuels which sometimes form as animals get trapped under the under layers of dirt and settled into the bottoms of the parts of the uh, geosphere. But throughout this process what's happening is that the things are cycling through all the parts of the earth. And just like the oceans were the major reservoir, reservoir is a place where the chemical will stay for a long period of time, in the carbon cycle the most major reservoir of life is going to be in the rocks. Second to that, there's a lot of carbon dioxide dissolved in the water and a little bit dissolved in the air. You can't deny that life is, of course, made of carbon. Carbon chemistry is the chemistry of life. We're going to learn more about it later in the years, the idea of organic chemistry. The chemistry of life is all about carbon. So definitely a fundamental aspect of the, the characteristics of life. You also have the nitrogen cycle. Now, I don't know, not everybody needs to know about this one, but it's also very important because nitrogen is one of the nutrients necessary for plants to make proteins. And plants don't just make sugar, they also make all the other building blocks of life. So they will need proteins. But this doesn't usually limit the ecosystem too much because there's a, something called a bacterial nitrogen fixation. So there's some bacteria that actually traps nitrogen from the atmosphere, which is the most common place for nitrogen in the world. Most of the atmosphere is made up of nitrogen. All right. Actually, it's about 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. So this bacteria will trap the nitrogen from the atmosphere and convert it to ammonia. This ammonia is the same ammonia that's produced by decomposers as they break down the dead carcasses and the waste of organisms that live. Some producers can use directly from the ammonia, but most of them rely on another bacteria, which is called um, nitrifying bacteria, which converts the ammonia to nitrates and nitrites, which then the producers, both in the land and the water, can actually use. Once in the producers, the nitrogen is incorporated into things like proteins and to spread out to the food web. And then as animals die or put waste, that returns to the soil in the form of ammonia, which then gets processed again in the part of the cycle. Now, there is another bacteria which can convert nitrates and nitrites back to the atmosphere. It's called a denitrifying bacteria. And this bacteria will return nitrogen to the, to the atmosphere, restoring the balance on the amount of nitrogen that exists there. But before that, nitrogen was already cycling through the, the ecosystem. And this is a process that's called 
uh, nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen cycle also involves lightning, which is capable of producing uh, nitrates and nitrites directly from the nitrogen in the air combining with the oxygen, which is in the air. The spark does that. And humans kind of do the same thing, and we do it because we want to add fertilizer to the soil. This is actually a concern. If the soil adds too much fertilizer and then it doesn't keep it, and rain comes and carries this fertilizer somewhere else, all of a sudden you're going to get ecosystems of the earth with a massive influx of fertilizer, and then things like algae bloom and eutrophication will happen, and that's bad for ecosystems, and we'll learn about that later. Now, another type of cycle is the phosphor cycle, and the only reason why this is super important is because phosphorus is a component of energy molecules inside your cell and of DNA, and also because it is usually the most limiting factor of the major nutrients of life. Phosphor is rare because unlike the other cycles which involve the atmosphere, which allows the chemicals to spread around the earth easily, the phosphor cycle never goes to the atmosphere. So it, all, it depends on rocks being eroded and move around by erosion and deposition. So it takes a very long time to happen, and this means that the nutrients are not as easily distributed as they are in the other cycles. Cycles which involve gaseous elements will cycle faster. Just like in the atmosphere, things will cycle faster since it's, the air moves a lot. Second to that, the water moves a little faster, and, and then to that, the life, which doesn't really last that long. So even if you stay in life for a very long time, eventually you're going to get to the apex predator, and then that chemical is going to end up back in the decomposer. And remember that since food chains are limited in their size, uh, you're not going to go on forever in life. So the chemicals usually start with the producers, but travel to the food chains, but ultimately, in just a few steps, they will go back to the soil. So... Life also cycles their chemicals very, very fast, but not as fast as the air or the water does. But on the geosphere, things will go very much slowly because it relies on processes like erosion and deposition, which take thousands of years to complete. This means that the phosphorus is one of the most limiting nutrients in ecosystems, especially aquatic ecosystems. Now, what that means is that just a little bit of phosphorus might make the ecosystem blow up in productivity, which is why a lot of times people add phosphorus to, to agriculture and other places like that. But as, again, like I said, if that soil does not take that uh, phosphorus, it doesn't usually do, what ends up happening is that the runoff will carry it and go aside into rivers and lakes and oceans and cause a massive growth of organisms that's called eutrophication that as we're going to learn in the next lecture series actually ends up killing the ecosystem so there again another example how human beings end up destroying habitats of the earth the same thing is true when you cut down trees now you have nothing to hold those nutrients in place and so the, the nutrients will tend to actually flow out of the ecosystems and then end up somewhere else on the runoff that we're not supposed to be but these all are all very important things for life, the, the cycles, and you have to know that the main important ones are the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the carbon cycle, and the, the water cycle. And remember that the only one that doesn't involve the air is the phosphorus cycle, and that tends to be the one that limits the most of the ecosystem because it circulates slower. And that elements don't really spend too long in life. But remember that this element that is inside of you today could have been the same element that was inside of an of a elephant thousands of years ago or a mammoth or even a dinosaur that became a fossil and then fossil fuels burn up and goes to the air and then you breathe, breathe the, the air, the plants brought breath, the photosynthesis and then you ate the plant and there you go, the carbon is inside of you. But it's the same element that was in the earth a long time ago because it's constantly cycling through the ecosystems of the earth. While energy, though, needs to be constantly flowing, and that is also going to limit the ecosystems because the energy flow, every time it gets transferred, remember what happens, it gets a little disorganized, and the animals will use some of the energy for work, some of the energy gets wasted as heat, and ultimately that causes a limitations to the amount of what an ecosystem can actually uh, support. That is ecology in shorter videos than the other ones I did. If there's anything you feel that you need more on, Watch the full lecture series on that topic, and I hope this is good, and uh, don't do anything that would not make a member proud.